Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. If you're from Paris, raise your hand. Good. Hi, Eve. Got to think a couple other Parisians. Uh, welcome. That being said, uh, very excited to be kicking off this panel. We have this title. Um, uh, let's see when they're going to put it on screen, which is From Insanity to Ingenuity, Seven Practical Tips for Navigating the AI Storm and DBAS Evolution. Or we could say, Not Another AI Talking KubeCon, the alternative title. <laughs> hey, okay, good. Thank you. Yeah, feel free to applaud. All right? Yo, give yourself a applause. Um, but for real, there are 13,000 people attending this conference, and we've been receiving a lot of information about AI. But I think it was actually yesterday in the keynotes that one of the speakers said that they only heard about Kubernetes for the first time a year ago. And we all know how easy it is to learn Kubernetes in a year, right? That being said, I think our community has a lot to show to the AI community, which is why we have an amazing panel um, with us today. We have Lisa, we have Joseph, we have Monica, and we have Eddie, all coming from different backgrounds. I'll have them explain that in a minute. But we really want to be practical here. Right? The idea is we're hearing there's lots of hype, there's smoke and mirrors, there's some BS, there's lots of other adjectives that we could use to describe it, which is why I wore this chili pepper shirt, because we're going to be having some hot and spicy takes on AI. That being said, before we get started, I would just like our panelists to introduce themselves. Lisa is one of my friends and mentors in the CNCF. She's the reason I became an ambassador, and she put this panel together. Um, so I want to give her a round of applause before we get started. All right. Well, Lisa, can you introduce yourself first so we can get to more of the content of the panel? Go for it. Thank you, Bart. And, th and thank you, everybody, who kindly said yes when I only had to make one phone call all the way around. So I was so excited because this is a group of absolute experts. And I, we do a lot of things in the community. I run the San Francisco Bay Area, really large user group, uh, Cloud Native Platforms, it's currently called. Um, I change the name a lot, but big meetup group, CNCF user group in the Bay Area. And that's I've been running that for over 10 years, um, and so I ended up becoming an ambassador, I don't know, four or five years ago or something. Um, and I do a lot of meetups, and since last October, I think every meetup I've run has either been on AI or on platform engineering, because does anyone want to talk about anything else? Um, and just listening to all these conversations about AI at the meetups really made me think, okay, we have... We need to like kind of you know herd some cats here, get some stuff together, have some really focused conversations. And so I called some of my favorite people uh, and said, let's have a great discussion about AI because we were having hallway discussions about this. And I was like, this needs to be on a bigger stage. So I really appreciate you all coming to this. We will leave a little bit of time for questions at the end um, from you. And uh, but I'm Lisa. I'm from the San Francisco Bay Area. If you want to attend one of our meetups, you can hit me up on CNCF Slack or LinkedIn. And I would love to get in touch with you. So I'm Joseph Sandoval. I work for Adobe with the Ethos team. I'm a principal product manager there. And the things that fall under my purview are things that are related to just Kubernetes as a service, as well as like traffic engineering and our API gateways. And uh, like all of you, they're maybe trying to grok what's really going on with this, how to get started. Um, I'm pretty basic, so hopefully I'll give you some strategies and ideas of like how I'm looking at these things with our platform, where I think opportunities are at, and hopefully there's some insights that you could take away. Hi, I'm Monica, and I'm founder and CEO of SETA, and SETA is a database, and our goal is to make it easier uh, to use, and we are building a solution on top of Postgres, and basically the tooling that you, our users need to make it easier to uh, use and manage and scale it in production. Before, I was in the monitoring space. Uh, I was at Elastic, uh, the company behind Elasticsearch, and happy to also share any thoughts about open source um, that I have quite a bit of experience in. Thank you. All right, I'm Eddie Wassef. I'm the resident cowboy uh, here on the panel. I'm from Dallas, Texas. I'm the uh, uh, chief architect at Vonage, which is part of Ericsson. Um, so Vonage and Ericsson, have, have a lot of people don't really know that we're still, you know, in business and we're actually doing a lot of cutting edge stuff. And what my role is over at Vonage is making sure that we are seeing what's out there, making sure that our communications APIs and our platforms are up to snuff, making sure that we take advantage of the latest and greatest technologies um, and presenting it to the company so that we can make sure that our communications and all of our services are available. Um, Kubernetes fanboy, and I'm, I'm really, really thank you for inviting me up here. I'm really excited to have this talk and hopefully take some of your questions. All right, Eddie, so you mentioned some of the stuff you're working on at Vonage. When it comes to AI, what are your concerns and what is the potential value that you see that it might add? Absolutely. So with, with AI in general, there's a lot of concerns around where this data is coming from, whether there's any bias one way or the other. 
And then whether or not when we use uh, AI APIs, is our data gonna be leaked? And I think that's probably a common uh, concern that a lot of people have. How do I use AI to enrich my product uh, without giving away my customer's private information? So that's probably one of the biggest concerns that we have. On the other side, we're seeing uh, AI being used building our products, building our operations. And again, where is that bias coming from? Is it going to be a little bit too eager uh, or is the, is the standard a little too high or too low for, for our products or applications that we're using? Fantastic. Joseph, in the case of Adobe, regarding concerns? I mean, there's always, you know, concerns. Um, the great thing about working for a company like Adobe is that we have been really early adopters. We're seeing it across a lot of our products. And so it's exciting to see because I think it's a real democratization of like some of the tools that have sometimes been difficult. Now, as far as like where I'm at uh, from a platform perspective, I mean, we're, we're looking at ways to use it to, to optimize, but you know, you have to really kind of give it some thought. And I think yesterday during the keynote, um, Paige Bailey, I think has really put out some really good guidance. And, and some of these things are just like, you know, are we in a race to kind of implement these things? Well, we, a lot of us have been technologists and we've gone through a lot of these journeys whether it's through automation tooling, even, even Kubernetes. And just because you can, I mean, yes, it, it's great to experiment, but I always kind of advise, like, you know, start with the easy things. So even in our case, like, we're looking at areas where, uh, from a platform perspective, we, we're using it, like, for support, like, in our bots. Can we optimize that, you know, that user experience uh, for our developers who use our platform? And I think the other areas that I look at immediately is like a lot of us who maybe have the persona of like an SRE or you're some other person that's in these environments where you're supporting, you know, you have run books, like ingest these things into an LLM. You can optimize a lot of that tribal learning and start creating that. And that, I think, builds that trust that you're going to need. So there is concerns, but I think there's safe ways to kind of get started. Really like that. And I like how you mentioned the point too, about we've seen other challenges, not the first one. And on top of thinking the stakeholders and the personas, Lisa and I got to know each other. Um, have you ever heard of the data on Kubernetes community or DOK, anybody? Well, once upon a time, this was a significant challenge, right? You should not run stateful workloads on Kubernetes was sort of the status quo. And in 2020, I started leading that community and led it for three years, which is where I met Lisa. Lisa, I'd like to know, you know, based on your experience seeing people coming together in a vendor neutral environment, something that's often provided in, in contexts such as the CNCF, um, open source in general, when we're approaching this topic of AI, what are the things that you've seen worked um, in terms of communities tackling challenges, in terms of strategies, um, ideas that could be implemented when it comes to this topic of AI? It's all over the place, <laughs> which is why I put this panel together. Um, I think Joseph just mentioned LLMs, uh, large language models, which actually makes me tempted to change my name to Lisa Lisa Marie, so I could actually have the coolest acronym, first name on the planet right now and be super trendy. I know you're a music fan from the 80s, so you get that reference. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, there, it, it's, it's an important conversation. I think what I'm noticing is it's still early days. There's a lot of people that, that have you know, tried different things. Um, when I put this talk together, I actually used zero AI to write this abstract, and I was told later when the talk was accepted from the track chair that it was a differentiator for me because I didn't use AI. It actually made the talk more unique. It showed the um, individuality, like the, you know, the problem with AI when everything is crowdsourced is you're getting basically what the crowd, you know, and uh, so I would, I encourage a lot of people, um, I don't know if this applies to writing lines of code, but it applies to a lot of other areas. Maybe don't use AI for your first draft maybe write the first draft and use AI for, you know, to, to enhance and to edit because most people right now are doing it the other way around. So apply that analogy to whatever you're using AI for. And just, I am still encouraging people to think it through because I've heard a few horror stories. I think, I hope Eddie talks to us later about sovereignty and where the data is coming from and where it lies and how much that freaks out some of our, our end users here. Um, but, you know, I think we're still early in the conversation. And I think the reason we called this seven practical tips is because we want to make sure that we get more tangible with these, with these, with these conversations and, and that we really focus on, you know, there's too many open-ended things. Like we're going to talk about open source in a little bit, and that's a super hot topic um, that is still very much debated. Uh, but I think as much as we can you know, like narrow this down and talk to end users and say, what problems are you having? And these are the stories I like to showcase in our user group. You know, what did you try? What did you, what broke? What did you do to fix it? And then share that knowledge with people. That's what's resonating the most right now. Fantastic. Monica, in your case, um, what are you and your company trying to get out of AI? What are you hoping to get out of it? 
Yeah, that's a very good question. And I want to start by, you know, in the last years I was, in the last year I was going to different events where there were like VCs, venture capitalists, and basically the biggest advanced advice that they give to companies is you need to uh, have sort of AI, uh, introduce your AI in your product. Even if you are a B2B or B2C type of company, in order to survive, you need to have a different way of, you know, providing, introducing uh, any AI capabilities in order to make it easier for your users to use it or to kind of have a different approach in order to differentiate. So AI is a big thing, uh, especially in early stage companies. And for us, actually, I think AI is uh, a very important part in order to really bring and make it build really better products. And this is, this, for example, in our case, we can really build a database that it's easier to use and we can really differentiate from all the other competitors. I think, um, you know, AI, for example, can help our users with giving uh, advice when to introduce an index, for example, when there are slow, slow queries. It can help you, for example, to uh, give you advices how to change your configuration. It can give you um, different changes that you can make on your schema and how this can affect your production. You can, for example, also generate the data model uh, by, by using the prompt. I think there are so many things that you can do with your AI and I'm really excited because for us, it re really helps us move fast, move, move fast forward and also reach the goal of the company in building a database that is easy to use and change the perception that users have with databases that are complicated, difficult to use, difficult to scale. And for us, it's, uh, it's an important uh, aspect of the company. Great. And I liked how you mentioned that, you know, the dichotomy of the VC pressure to mention AI at all costs. And if we walk around, you know, the solution showcase, we'll probably see quite a few organizations that are maybe pumping that message as well. But then, like you said as well, the, the positive side of things that, that can be helpful to, to make people's jobs easier. And I'd like to know, in you know, your opinion on this, is it a blessing or is it a curse? Are there tool sets that are going to enable um, developers, DBAs to do their jobs better? And are there any things you can mention specifically in Vonage that are happening right now? Sure. I mean, I can give you my insights on that. Whether or not I can give you details about the company, uh, I don't know. I'll probably avoid There's an NDA that might disagree with yes, you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, I saw, and I know most of us are on Reddit at some point, but there was a really funny meme that said uh, developers in the future, and it had a sign that said certified organic handwritten code. Um, you know, since everything is being Gen AI'd uh, these days, uh, it's seems like that's the direction we're going. But a lot of the things that I see uh, that are valuable uh, for us is, uh, you know, like Monica mentioned, being able to give that opinion based on uh, kind of where you're going, making the recommendations. Hey, maybe you're going down the wrong path, right? Maybe you need an index here. Maybe your data model is going to cause, uh, you know, issues and, and friction in the future. Um, what we're really seeing or what we're focusing on in the beginning stages uh, uh, you know, to Joseph's point, is we're looking at the easy things. We're looking at the code gen, looking at the, uh, the log analysis, the anomaly detection, things that can help us build our product in a more resilient and uh, a scalable way uh, versus directly going into our product. Now, we're still looking at in incorporating AI into our products that we deliver to our customers, but that's a little bit more, you got to make sure you've had the quality, you got to make sure you've taken care of the biases, you got to make sure all of our I's are dotted and our T's are crossed. Um, primarily, we're looking at things like KHGPT, we're looking at tools around uh, trace, trace log analysis, we're looking at uh, a lot of uh, open source, uh, um, maybe whether it's licensing or whether it's vulnerability analysis and where these things can affect us. And so we're looking at some of these tools early on before it really gets into our, our IP and taking that and feeding it back to the developers. So, there's, it's, a, it's a huge world that we're, we're, uh, we're seeing, and we're trying to take the things that are going to help us without exposing us too much. You want to follow up on that? Yeah, I, th I think, you know, very similarly, I think of maybe a few have caught this at the conference, um, but there's, there's some interesting projects like, you know, LLM Manetti's, which one of the first use cases it has is it, like you can do chaos engineering with it, which, you know, if you're doing chaos engineering, the, the intent the behind it kind of aligns. 
Um, other, other things like I think last year, and this is kind of where I started really started thinking about this even from a platform perspective, when we were in Amsterdam, you know, we started to see like ChatGPT dropped and there was companies like Kubia and you see other companies where they were coming in and they had done a lot of the work around early on with guardrails. And I think you can also make that decision of, you know, you don't always have to go it alone. There may be an option where you may think about where maybe, maybe that may be a good, a good option, you know, a more buy approach to some company that's really been in that space so that you you do things that it's in a non-destructive manner. Um, and there's a lot of guidance as well. So one thing I didn't mention earlier is I'm a member of the CNCS End User Technical Advisory Board and closely working along with this is the team that since Chicago um, QCon, they have released now the AI land, a white paper as well as the landscape. And really, it's just a starting point. And I think a lot of us are all on this journey. And there's some things that are not fully open and available to us yet. So we're really in a nascent time where a lot of us from a community perspective can lean in, can help to provide some of those insights that are going to help so that we can find those safe entry points. But I, I think overall, like, um, you know, just like Eddie was mentioning, you know, we're, we're trying to find areas where it's, it's, it's done in a way that, you know, can we, can we save time? Can we move toil out of a lot of the work that we're doing? And I do see those opportunities. KGPT is a good example of that where a lot of times we have just so many, like, we'll have tickets come in needing more information. And when you can have that query Kubernetes and just do a read to find the information that you may close the gap, shorten that mean time to resolution. Like, I think those things are really highly valuable from a, from that perspective. I think, uh, I mean, most of you here in the audience are engineers and we also like trying to question ourselves how our jobs will look like with AI in a few years. And you know, there is already, it might be that there won't be any software engineer role in a few years. You know, there is already a AI um, software engineer uh, that was launched recently. Uh, so I don't know. Um, I mean, putting the joke on the side, uh, I don't think that will happen in my opinion. I think uh, AI will be just a co-pilot for software engineers, a way to um, make their job easier. Uh, so I don't think the AI will replace completely um, the jobs that the software engineer job. Um, I also think that what AI, in my opinion, will bring is that um, you know, because the tools will become more intelligent and it will make it the life of the developer will be easier. Um, depending, the developers, platform engineers, SREs and so on, I think it will be easier. And I think the trend will be that the big difference will be that in the future, I assume that you will be able to run and build a company with less resources. And, you know, instead of hiring 100 people, uh, to build um, a new product or, uh, for example, a database company, you will need less resources. And we still see this nowadays. You know, there are companies that are um, have 10, 20 people and they are valued 1 billion. Uh, and I think with AI, that will really um, move fast, faster. So when I started SATA, actually, I was thinking, I think this is a future where you will be able to build a company with less resources. How can we uh, make this, how can we start now in order to be there in five years, in order to kind of uh, go after this trend? Um, so that's kind of the, was the, the initial idea. But yeah, I think on, uh, on, you know, putting the joke on the side, I think, you know, there will still be software engineer roles uh, or engineering roles because someone needs to train those models, someone needs to use those models. And, you know, there will always be new tools that we need to, um, we need to have. Uh, so I think definitely maybe less job, like the amount of jobs will be um, maybe uh, less than it is now. But I still think that there will be uh, a component. So that's my, <laughs> if you want, the, what I think the future will be. I, I absolutely agree with you that the job will still be there, but I think it'll be significantly changed because it's the ability of the developer to use AI to their advantage, I think is going to probably reduce the number of, of developers that the world has maybe or needs, um, but also it's going to be a differentiator of how well they can do their jobs, right? If you can use the tools at your disposal to build a better React application or a Kubernetes operator or a database as a service, um, that 
is going to be a new skill that's going to be needed for the software developer starting last year. Um, you know, you've, you've heard 10Xers, right, or the unicorn. Now it's, a, now it's a reality. I mean, a 10Xer from, you know, what we called a, a super developer last year, they can do that with Copilot. They can do that with some of the tools out there today. Um, and then that's just going to raise the bar. So I absolutely think it's still going to be needed. I don't entirely agree with the uh, NVIDIA CEO that said, you're never going to need to learn to code. You're going to need to learn to code, but you're going to need to learn to code in how to use AI to your advantage in all aspects. Now, one of the things we wanted to talk about is in terms of what AI can learn and benefit from in terms of what uh, in, uh, regarding CNCF can offer. Talking about open source standards, open source licensing, licensing and governance. Lisa, you want to start out with that? I'm glad you asked this question. Um, a little over a year ago, I'm also a founder of a conference called Kube Crash. It's kubecrash.io, and we're about to do our fifth one in, in April, April 24th. It's virtual. You can all attend. Um, and we focused, uh, over a year ago, we, we did one of them on AI and ML and also zero trust, and we started talking a lot about security elements around AI, and there was a, a lot of fear, and that part of the conversation hadn't gone you know, far enough yet. A year later, it, it really... It's there, but what I saw at AI.dev in December, um, that's a Linux Foundation conference if you're not aware of it, and they're doing one in Paris, I believe, um, pretty soon, so you should all go, and then there's gonna be another one back in, I think Seattle's the next one. Um, but we were at one in San Jose in December, and there was a lot of talk about how open should AI be, how open source should AI be, and of course it's a Linux Foundation conference and so there was a lot of advocacy for it to be very open source. And then there was a lot of talks about, well, wait, 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 we don't have the standards, you know, in place, we don't have the structure, how, are, what about the governance, you know, and a lot of fear. And so I think we're still not even in the middle, but in the beginning of these conversations. And I just had a hallway talk with Liz Rice about uh, this very thing. And, you know, it's like, yeah, we can try to talk about security and, and how are we going to, you know, get biases out of the code and things like that. But I think um, if it's going to be, if open source is going to be a big part of it, then obviously you need licensing conversations, you need standards conversations. So I think we're just in the beginning there. But what I'm really curious about is as... Um, as, a, as a company, as an end user, as a consumer of this technology, how much do you care how open source this all is? Well, I think all of us do. And, and I think it, we're, we're touching on, all, I think, quite a few things here. And, you know, we're here at an open source conference. We all really believe in it. We all, a lot of us have been in this Kubernetes journey for, for quite a while. And being in San Francisco, especially as watching the last year, like there's a whole other ecosystem that's been grown. And what is considered open there is probably not the same definition of what we probably define it as. Is there concerns? There is, you know. And then as well as kind of like the ethics is some of the things I think about, like how these things are trained, the foundational models aspect of these things, you know, we look at it. We can, you can obviously see there's been lawsuits that are related to like some of the information that's contained in the models. You, you, you got to be, you know, very cognizant of that. So that, I think that's where open source will be very interesting. The one thing great about the EU is like, as far as like privacy and information, the EU has always led the United States. And I think my, my hope is that there'll be more questioning around that because I think it's, yes, the open source aspect of it, what, what is that and what does that license look like? But then as well as kind of like, you know, what data is being used? You know, is it's copyrighted things? These are the things that I, I sometimes think about. And, you know, we want to make sure that those things are respected. So that's kind of where areas where I think are going to be important and the community could play a, a key aspect. Monica, would you like to comment a bit about, you know, what we, what's considered open source code, open source project, as opposed to some of the things we're hearing about in the AI ML space? Yeah, I think it's important to acknowledge that what means an open source model is not the same with an open source code. So if you have, for example, a project that is open source, what this means is that you can go read the code, understand the project, what it's doing, uh, and for example, be even able to fork the code and, and ha like do your own because you kind of learn from the, the previous project. With open source model, is different. So what means an open source model? Basically, you get the weight. 
And what this means is that if I give an example, you know, the GROC uh, from XAI basically is 300 gigabytes of flow numbers. So it's not very similar, right, if you understand with uh, an open source code. Yeah? You just get flow numbers and, and basically this is something that uh, you can just play with it and, and see how it goes for your own um, needs. Uh, but you have no idea about how this was trained, what kind of data were used. So if you want an, an analogy is to me, an open source model is similar with, you know, having uh, a project that is not open source and you just get the binary, download the binary and you can try it out, but you have no idea about this, like how this uh, project was built before. Uh, I don't know, maybe the, you know, there are lots of discussions in the last year about open source and AI, and I think maybe that will change. You know, there are some companies that believe in open source from the AI, from the top AI leaders, and some are open source, some are closed source. I think I'm kind of curious, me personally, to see how this will evolve the open source aspect of the models. Yeah, you know, it's really interesting, you know, Monica, you were asked something in, in the previous comment around VCs pushing everyone to kind of have some AI flavor in their products. And I think that's causing companies to just rush and do it. And I think open source will be very helpful to let companies experiment, especially when their legal or compliance says, hey, you're not shipping this data out to an API. So they can now put it on their systems and it may not perform, it may not be the best, but it's something that lets them experiment and see Actually, how can you use API or sorry AI in your uh, systems? And I also think there's a bit of confusion. Like this is the big data or the uh, the blockchain of you know the, today. AI has been around for a while. There's narrow AI. There's general AI. Now there's generative AI. These are all different flavors of AI. Um, and in the data world, for example, we've had narrow AI for a while, where it would look at the behavior and recommend indexes. Right. That was a very specific AI that existed for that product, but Everybody is really intrigued with generative because they saw what ChatGPT can do or, or, or um, an open AI. But when you think about the value that Copilot took, which is your, especially the one on Bing, let's say the free one, they know who you are, they know your search, and they've got the internet to add to it, that's adding more value. And companies are like, well, I gotta do that too. I've got data, I've gotta figure out a way to get it out there. And a lot of times that causes data leakage, that causes issues, and I think the ethical part that you mentioned, Joseph, is very important. And I hope that more and more companies that push for open sourcing are going to force the standards or they're going to force looking at these models, figuring out where the biases are, figuring out a way to identify biases. And we've seen that evolution from the beginning of when it just generated something to generating it, giving you the sources that it's using in the generation and also the reasoning why. So that was something that the community pushed. And I think some regulation had something to do with it. But Ultimately, it's, it's up to everybody here to, you know, push your, your companies, push your regulators to say, look, we see the value. We need to show where the problems can be through open source contribution, through open source usage, through blogging and talking about it like we are, um, to really bring that to fruition because it's a tremendously powerful tool. Um, I can't live without it anymore, to be honest. Uh, I, get, I get these long emails, I send it to ChatGPT and tell me, just summarize it, please, right? And it does it, right? I can't live without it anymore. So that's where I see really the open source aspect, the, the ethics about it. Um, it. It's really just starting and we really need to be the driver behind it. Great. Now we're getting towards the end. We're gonna have a, some bit of time for questions. So I wanna hear though from you, Joseph, first, in terms of what's gonna be your next AI step? What's the next step that you're gonna be taking regarding that, you know, from a Kubernetes perspective, from someone who's very active in the CNCF, the work that you're doing, what's going to be happening for you in the next few months? I mean, I, th I think like a lot of us, it's, it's still a time of experimentation, but, you know, safe experimentation. You know, I'm always looking, as, as I was mentioning earlier, for ways to really, like, improve the user experience. Even last year when I really started to kind of grok what was happening and what potentially you could do with, like, generative AI, I was like, this could potentially be, and, and this is a product, guys, so I'm thinking, like, this, this could be a user interface that I can use to maybe take some of the friction around a lot of the, the work that we do with some of the apps, like, because we're a very GitOps-type platform, and, you know, could we use this as a way to kind of help, you know, 
ease some of the pain of, you know, all the, a lot of the PRs were cutting, have some validate, do a lot of these things. So we looked at a lot of those things initially, but then I think we took a step back and said, let's, let's, let's look at the areas that we could really help our users with support. And so that's kind of, I think, I see continual experimentation there. Now, long term, I definitely see this evolving. I see there's a lot of opportunities in the observability space to really find those needles in the haystack. And to me, that's the other areas where I think it's going to be a, you know, a real game changer and to help improve some of those experiences with things like open telemetry and all these areas where you, you have so much inputs that, you know, how can I find these things that are very difficult for someone, uh, you know, on the team, you know, who's managing so much infrastructure as we scale. So that's me from a more pragmatic perspective. Okay. Monica, what about you? What's next? I mean, I think I would want to say the same thing. We are in an experimentation uh, period of time, so we kind of try to figure out how we can uh, leverage AI more in order to build an easier database to use for people. So, Or are you going to become a VC? Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think it's... Uh, you know, I think it's uh, interesting. Yeah, I don't know. I mentioned this, and and now you uh, you're already saying. But I think you know, technical companies like B two B, but companies that are building something technical, they are um, easier for them to adopt AI. But I think for me, this advice that we see gave is usually. You know, the way, the way happening is that all the VCs have the same advice for their companies and regardless of the type of the companies. But I, I, I saw companies, B2C type of companies, uh, struggling and, and asking around other technical founders how they should integrate AI in their uh, product, uh, you know, application that, you know, they're exposing to their end users. Uh, they are not very used with AI. So I think that's interesting. All right, for me, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna go a little bit out there. I want to build the computer from the Star Trek Enterprise where using generative AI to create API calls, right? And I know you can you know, program it, but I want it to learn to read our documentation, be able to generate an API call and do it. Because how cool is it to ask a computer to do something and then say, go set whatever parameter on whatever system and it knows how to do it. And using the Gen AI, uh, I think, I think that'll be a really cool future where you can just talk to your computer like you do Alexa with any API and it figures out how to do it. Let us know. That could become another talk. That'd be great. Absolutely. Yeah, we get an excuse to get together. Lisa, you organize this panel. I think it's fair you have the final word. We are going to take time for questions. Of we course. got the five minute sign. So we saw that. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm just excited to see what we build. I mean, I love this community because I love the way we, we approach challenges, right? I mean, you and I both lived through the era of you can't run anything stateful on Kubernetes. And I just spent the last six years at two different startups running lots of state on Kubernetes, big applications, cloud native storage, a database company that I was at for the last three and a half years. So I, I love the way we solve problems. And really, it's the user community that pushes us to solve these problems. You know, I, I've dragged... A, Lots of companies, DreamWorks, HBSC, on stage to talk about what they built. And when the same, at the same time, someone's next door saying, you can't do that. Don't, don't try that. You'd be silly. So I, I love this community. I love to see what we're going to, um, how we're going to tackle this problem. And I think we really just need to keep in mind, how are people trying to use this? How are, you know, let's talk to the people that are running stuff to see what is really breaking. And those are the folks, I mean, Eddie, you and I have had so many conversations about uh, government standards and, you know, what, like, yeah. insecurity especially and how that's going to dictate how you build things. And that's not always things that we think about. You know, we're, we're so narrow focused and when we're on a certain project or in a certain part of this ecosystem, we don't always spend enough time talking to our end users who are thinking about every single part of this. Um, so I just, you know, keep, keep those conversations conversations happening. I'll keep showcasing them. Uh, and I'm just really excited to see what we build. Yeah, I think a lot of this comes down to the fact of seeing the different opportunities where people can get involved, where their questions can be addressed, where their concerns can be taken care of. And, and in the same way that you do for Kubernetes or whatever open source projects that you're working on, to treat the subject in a similar manner and not fall in, you know, be a victim of, of the hype and some of the more negative things we may have mentioned previously. Um, that being said, I think we can open up the time now for, for questions if anyone as one. There's microphones in the in the front. So uh, was that Ramiro? Yeah, yeah, just right there, there or there. 
My question is really quick about licensing. Uh, you talked about Copilot, large language models that are, you, you ask it to generate uh, a piece of code, it gives it to you. Um, a lot of times that data is going to come from sources that have many different licenses behind them. Um, from a compliance, legal, or risk management standpoint for large enterprises that are deploying this, what's their risk exposure and how does that get managed in an open source community that's trying to advocate for the use of this software? Not all at once. <laughs> so that's actually a really interesting question that's come up a lot, especially around Copilot. And it's one of those things where it's like, well, developers can go to Stack Overflow or GitHub and copy the code. Now they're just able to do it a lot more efficiently, a lot quicker. Um, is that okay? And you know, it's a mixed bag, right? There's a lot of, it's still very early. I think uh, Microsoft and GitHub are doing a great job at at least letting us know where the data is being processed, where it's coming from. That helps a little bit, but it's, it's a new frontier, right? And you have to make the decision for the industry and the company that you're in, whether or not that's something that you are willing to, to take on, whether you think that it's going to be a breach of any kind of copyright or not. Uh, but for the most part, it's very early. I think we're getting a lot of the tools from the vendors. Um, but at the end of the day, just like anything else, you've got to make the decision for, for you and for your company. Thank you for the panel, super interesting. On the topic of hype, I would like to hear your thoughts on the, the role of CNCF on AI. I live in San Francisco, there are two very different ecosystems. Do you think CNCF should care about AI or is it just driving with the hype? You're in San Francisco, you see the same thing I see. Like, I don't think people realize how huge it is in SF. Like, I, you hear like this whole perception, the generative, Gen AI collective, lane space, like there is a lot of events happening. There's a whole world happening. I think if we don't focus on it, and, and I think yesterday was a great look, look where we went from Chicago when we were talking about on this keynote stage, some, where we were at with Kubernetes versus like what we had on yesterday. So I think the focus is there, but there's more work to be done. But the, that community is huge and it's, it's, a, it's a lot different of a beast. So I, I think it, there's alignment and I'm, I'm excited to see how we continually like work together. I'd like to add as well, absolutely CNF should get involved, right? Because the, if we look at what it did with Kubernetes, it took, it took a project and it beat all the incumbents because of the community behind it. It's an unstoppable force. And if we really want to, yep, if we really want to make sure that the ethics is taken care of and the open sourcing of the algorithms, it has to be driven by the community. And so I encourage everybody to do so, everybody to get involved, start talking about it, learning about it, and let's get the CNCF on it. Last thing. If anybody can please take a picture of our names with us and send it to my LinkedIn, I'd love it. I've never been on stage like this and it's really exciting. <laughs> Thank you very much.